this season on Growing Wild, I've travelled the region and expanded my perspective on sustainable farming. Not easy, man. I've been both student. Oh man, we didn't even turn on the fire. And teacher, <laughs> chef, and guinea pig. Mmm, mm. good. My journey has been food for the mind. Who would like a more green? Allowing me to imagine what more we can do with the things around us. These are actually the fruits for us to make into inks. It's also planted some ideas in my head about how we can not just grow food better, it smells beautiful, but also safeguard the environment at the same time. They are responsible for the pollination of about 60% of the food that humans eat. On top of that, I'm making some big changes in my life. I'm pumped and ready to take on the brave new world of urban farming. Oh, hello. Yeah, these are what we call domestic house crickets. The production cycle takes about 40, 45 days. All right, Nick, do you just wake up one day and decide, it's my ambition to be a cricket farmer? The thing is, I've always been looking into alternative proteins as a food source. They are quite superior. Nutritionally, they are very good. Protein-wise, they're very high, I dare say 60%. If you compare that to, uh, to beef uh, or to chicken, they're much higher. Chickens and beef, the protein content is around 25, 26% or something like that. How do you harvest the crickets? Do you just like come in with a big net and you like start, you know? No, 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 yeah, but you know, similar. Okay, what would I uh, just show you? Sure. Dig this guy. Oh See? my gosh, there's so many of them. Yep. We give him a shake. When we do that, See? we don't collect all the frost. Basically, they're poop. Yes, so exactly. All the yeah. frost. Yeah. All of them will be on the floor, everywhere. You get a clean victory, so let them climb in and shake them into a collecting bin. So, Nick, I know I like eating stuff. Okay. <laughs> but can you just pick one up and eat them? No, please, please don't do that. I can show you how we prepare them. Okay. After we've collected the, the, the crickets, we put them in the freezer right away. The crickets go through a round of freezing before washing and roasting to remove all moisture. Okay, Chris, this you can eat. Hey, yeah. that's Have music to my ears. Have a look. <laughs> oh. You want to give it a try? Can I? Sure. It smells really good. What does that smell remind you of? Uh, some like cashew nuts, almost. Oh. And it's a little bit like shrimp. It looks kind of gnarly at first. Mm -hmm. You're like, Ugh. but you know, the legs how about, are all. What the taste? It, it tastes amazing. It, it really tastes like nuts. Like, and um, ikan bilis. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. This really tastes like ikan bilis. Yeah. Good stuff, man. Yeah. yeah. Good. Mm. Glad you like it. Cool. Okay, at this point, I have to tell you, the audience, something. For the foreseeable future, I've decided to join Nick to become a cricket farmer too. Ooh. Yep, I got bored of growing only vegetables. Solid egg sauce is ready. I'm just gonna put the crickets in. To start off my insect journey, I've come up with a dish that I hope people can accept. Salted egg crickets with wild pepper leaf. Cricket farming was something that was not done before in Singapore. And so the opportunity to start something new it's really interesting for me. I need to take it from startup phase to something a lot more uh, bigger. I'm gonna jump right in. And go for it, man. Oh, oh, oh. Favorite dish. Also, I got some um, wild pepper leaf. Mm. I thought it might be nice to like wrap it like a taco. Because this is quite strong in flavor. And then this herbs will kind of cut through the flavor. To be honest, I have a little bit of my doubts that Singaporeans are going to be receptive on eating crickets in its crickety form. Mm. But I think if it's done in a powder form, they might be more receptive if it's done in a smoothie or a bubble tea or something like that. 
And I think if, say, something happens with climate change and something needs to move, actually Quickie is a really good solution to increase production as an alternative protein source. This is, this is what is this? Dude, this is just pure cricket powder in hot water. We are really like planning for the future. This is the future. <laughs> and we might actually be ahead of our time, which could be a little bit of a risk, but high risk, high reward. Making the cricket farm commercially viable is my number one priority. But it doesn't end there. I'm also interested in how it can close some gaps in our food system. One crazy idea I have is to expand on an existing farming system like aquaponics. We can turn crickets into fish feed, which translates into nutrient-rich poop water. This then nourishes the plants, which becomes food for the crickets in a holistic cycle. That's why I've come to find Boon Hien. He helped out with our aquaponics project previously, and he has lots of hungry fish. Okay, Boon Hien, this is a total experiment. <laughs> I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> but in my mind, I'm just thinking, okay, the fish like us will probably need some carbohydrates. Yes. Uh, some protein, mm. some uh, minerals. Mm. So I'm not following any recipe, just, uh, just anyhow. I'm thinking the protein can come in the form of crickets. These crickets look dry. How dry are they? They are very dry, they are like below 5% moisture content. The carbohydrates will come in the form of tapioca starch. Mm. Apparently this is quite easy for them to digest mm. versus something like wheat. And I think eggs might help as a binder ah. to, to put it together. Okay. Yeah. Even though these are off-the-shelf ingredients, it is very possible to slowly replace them with food waste. Yeah, you can probably get from some of these soybean exactly, yeah. stores. In Singapore, we waste about 30 to 40% of all food that's brought in. So I'm sure we can find sources or ingredients. So yeah, the paste needs to be thicker. Must be thicker. Yeah. This is uh, too watery. What do you have now? <laughs> right, I think we've got our uh, fish bead. Ooh, ah, cool, we've got a little pellet. So bone hand, you know, like, it sounds like urban farms are the problem solvers for a lot of food security issues and food mm. waste issues. So what's stopping us from making it happen? I think it's, it is cost. Uh. It's still the cost of operation. It's a very high cost to try to re reuse those waste. Mm. Collecting the waste, setting it aside, storing so that there is sufficient volume to use it in the production. These are all costs. Huh? If there is a way that uh, the farm can work and be integrated in government's urban planning, it will be cheaper for us to then try to reuse the waste or pass our waste to maybe a cricket farm mm. uh, in the same block. All the costs will be minimised. Yes. And correct. all the outputs will become inputs of another system. Mm. That's the way to go. Yep. <laughs> The... We have the solution, all right? <laughs> <laughs> and we have the food pellet solution too. Looks, it's, like, it's, looks like it's getting... Looks good, yeah. In the right shape. Yeah, it's floating. So exciting. <laughs> this is me eating fish food. It does taste like bubble tea. <laughs> bubble tea pulls. <laughs> <laughs> With a bit of the nutty flavour. Yeah, they look interested. With a growing area of about 2,000 square feet, Boonhian's farm produces around 20 kilograms of vegetables a week. Urban farming in Singapore is different from urban farming in another country. A lot of our settings are things that is suitable for us, not necessarily suitable for another urban farm elsewhere. Where do you get inspiration from? We learn a lot from YouTube. Mm -hmm. uh, but you have to innovate. You have to take what is available existing, make it work for your farm. If you just take the entire solution, lot, stock, barrel, you assemble without making adjustments, chances are it will fail. I think you're the one of the, or the only urban farm that's indoors that I've seen that's not air conditioned. Yes, you can always just do the textbook urban farm, aircon the place, sit it up, very clean environment, sterile, but it is the expense of cost. Can your cost structure allow you to survive? Yeah. This one looks very DIY. Yeah, Did different. you actually make this yourself? Yes, we, we cut this ourselves. There is about a thousand of these tubes. Each of these tubes, we have 14 cuts. So it's 14,000 cuts we have done here. It's the engineering mind that, that help us do this. It's your brain. Your, your, what's in your brain? Yeah, we're, <laughs> we're engineer by train. So as we move from desktop prototyping to a boutique small farm, 
to projecting what we hope to be a larger scale farm, then that is why we have to keep innovating, adjust. You see, the magic word is adjust and it becomes very possible. There's a rep in the industry that aquaponics is very difficult to do. Many people say it's almost impossible to be commercially viable. So why are you so crazy to decide that you want to try taking up this challenge? We started off because we felt it is because it is difficult. And we've always said if we can successfully make aquaponics commercially viable at large scale, then truly it's a meaningful way to address food source, food availability, the sustainability of the whole food supply. Dropping about 10 grams of feet. Woohoo! Alright, Nick, let's go on a holiday. Yeah. <laughs> we don't need to feed anymore. Exactly. <laughs> so, I think this version 1, I think version 2, subsequently, you'll be able to control over the air. La. You can tune it over your phone. Then you'll just That's accept the it. Then you'll we'll be sitting in yeah. Bali and feeding our crickets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, Joe, actually, we've been. We've actually been feeding, experimenting with uh. feeding <laughs> our crickets vegetables <laughs> recently. Uh, well, it's not cheaper yet, but we found that the crickets grow up to 30% faster. I see. And they seem to be happier as well. Okay. So every vegetable has a different shape and size. The big question is, are we able to automate the feeding of vegetables? I think straight out of my mind, I'm thinking, some question is, do we have to feed it as this vegetable? If it can be grinded up, then we can just we just need to change this to a grinder, right? Then you just put all the vegetable inside. Ooh. As it feed, then you just grind and deposit. Right. I mean, that's the beauty of engineering. Right? Anything you have can be done, just that whether it's effective or not. Sounds good. For the past few months, Nick and I have been busy iterating the cricket farming process. Besides automating some of the manual tasks, Ooh, we've nice. also changed the configuration of each cabin. We've been thinking about how we can make this system a lot more scalable. So even though there's three layers now, but you can think in a skyscraper, you could do you know as many as 50 layers, 100 layers. Uh, the sky is the limit. Sustainability is also a big part of my focus here. And I'm trying to see whether the crickets eat stuff that we can grow for them and use the waste of the crickets to grow the stuff that they eat. So it's a complete closed loop cycle. So we've been testing out growing the veggies in a hydroponic system, feeding it purely only the waste of the crickets. Um, and it's been doing really well. You can see the plants are green and they are thriving. And we're going to try it now in a soil-based system. But vegetables aren't the only produce that we can get creative about. We are searching for a mushroom farmer in the unlikeliest of places. We're actually in a light industrial building, flanked by housing estates. Welcome to Sport Gardens. So what we're doing is reimagining how we can bring macro-urban farms back into the hearts of everyone's life. That's amazing! Yeah. Look so at those cute little mushrooms! Yeah, so, so this is a fully controlled environment room. It's called CEA, Control Environmental Agriculture. I, I think climate control is great, but you know, there's always this question about the cost of it. It's going to be very pricey. Uh, yes, that's true. But the way that we run the system is to strip out all those bells and whistles, and we really break down to the core fundamentals of how we grow crops and the bare essentials only. And it's running mainly off automation. We have three different types of mushroom. The center, uh, Yamabushi, which is also known as lion's mane in Asian context. Yanagi, Matsutake. I can't imagine you grow Yanagis in here. It's so special. And we have pink oysters. These are some of the varieties that we don't really see much in Singapore mm. because it's difficult to transport and very fragile itself. These mushrooms are so cute. I feel bad harvesting them. Look, it's almost looking like hair. Yeah. How, so how do you know when it's ready? So when you see the teeth here, they're like the, the spines. Teeth? Yeah. So these are called the teeth. Ooh. So when they're long enough, a couple of centimetres long, they're ready for harvest. There you go. Nice. So you can see. So this is just the lion's main block itself, the mushroom, the fruiting body. 
Wow, it's super easy. It's like almost effortless to do it. Yes. I, I don't see Lion's Mane in the market, you know. I, I've had it a couple of times, but I don't... I wish I could see it more in supermarkets. Yeah. So in supermarkets, typically they sell dried versions because that's the easiest way of form to ship it around the world and it has a long shelf life. So for this one, the Yanagi Matsutake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you hold near to the base. Ooh. And then, yep. And then just pull it out. Sorry guys. Oh, ah, there you go. Success. Yeah. Look at that. The last and biggest one, pink oysters. So what you do is, you hold the bag and you hold the base. Yeah. You then just lift up and pull out the whole cluster. Yeah. Oh. There you go. Oh, oh. There you go. Oh, damn. Oh! Ah! Uh, almost. Failed. No, but it's still good. So this is a full oh. cluster of pink oysters. It's beautiful. Now close your eyes and you just take a sniff. It smells, like, it smells like seafood. It yes, like prawn. It, it is. It, it has a seafood smell to it. I'll add it to your stash. <laughs> what? <laughs> Dude, I've got no more space. Don't worry. It'll fit in our tummies. <laughs> John has also been engaging in some food R&D. David is a private dining chef who's made the Yamabushi the star of his clay pot rice dish. Esther is a baker and she's been pairing the Yanagi mushrooms with her breads. So these mushrooms here are actually very chewy and meaty as compared to a dried version of the lion's mane. Mm. So usually it comes in dry form, so we got to soak it and rehydrate it and reconstitute the water inside. The trouble with that is it might be a little bit too wet to, to work with high heat. When it's fresh, it's easier to stir fry and coax the flavour out. So there's, there's no way you can get this kind of amazing extra depth of flavours when you're using dried ones. There are ways to do, but mm. it's definitely a bit harder. Mm. Yeah. How about price? Food cost is definitely rising. We will continue to do so, for sure. We definitely need people to start buying local to make it more accessible and affordable, definitely. So someone needs to start first, right? Yeah. The price might be a bit higher, yeah. but then over time it will drop. Right. With more economies of scale. So what we have here, the ultimate wow. monster. <laughs> so by doing different control environments, we actually can manipulate the way the mushroom grows. Maybe it will be something palatable to what you are doing. You know back at the bakery, we actually have this small little chabata. And usually we top it with portobello and just roast it. So, you know, knowing that Yanagi can grow into this science, mm. this can be another alternative that we chefs and bakers can actually explore, which yeah. is great, yeah. I think when people think about farming, we always talk about it having to have economies of skill, it having to be very large and producing huge amounts of things. The, the flavour of the lion's mane is very delicate and it comes through in this. It feels good that I don't need to cook today. <laughs> From this journey, I've realised that small is beautiful. Farms that are small are able to produce um, something of quality and they're able to go and explore the nuances of growing a produce to a much deeper level. And that is, that's a very powerful thing to have. You know, what, what keeps it going is, is this. You know, it's cultivating the relationships between growers and chefs. And having these conversations about you know, how to grow food, how to grow better, um, what we can do to change um, people's consumption habits and inspire people. So this makes me so happy seeing all of us come together. I've always wanted to actually connect and engage with local farmers because I feel that it's our responsibility as chef to actually educate our people through the food that we make. Yeah, so this is my goal like, as we move forward. I believe there's always a lot of opportunities for chefs to, to do something more, you know, not just, just cook. For a long time, I felt that we ourselves don't value our own farmers. We don't value our own produce. How's it, Chris? Wow, love it, man. The more I experience and learn about these urban farms, meeting guys like Boon and guys like John, where they, as farmers, lifted the standards, the more I feel like this could be Singapore's solution. We've just been so accustomed to buying things off the shelf and without realising what value that we can bring. And we just need the ideas to come together and we can produce something that's really, really amazing and incredible. So, I want to try that too. <laughs> you just use your hands and just yeah. How's it, Chris? Too yummy to speak. <laughs> Rex 
right now in Singapore, the way we produce and consume food is evolving. Little by little, we are taking small steps to close the gaps in our food system in order to make it more sustainable. My mom is too full to say that. <laughs> but how can we push the envelope a little further? That's what I've come to Australia to find out. Pope's Produce runs a community-supported agriculture model. It sounds complicated, but what it really is is a subscription a vegetable box model. So a customer would commit a certain period of getting vegetables every week and you'll pay a certain amount. So the thing is, if you have more produce, because the weather is good, you get a bounty of harvest. If the weather is bad, you might get very little or even no produce. These are the most sexy lemons I've seen in my life. I know. They're called Eureka lemons, and once you've zested them, you can even eat the white pith. And it has a consistency of dried apple, and it's a little bit sweet. Ooh. So you can do the scratch and sniff. Mm. And what's the biggest lemon you've grown? Um, the largest was 800 grams, so almost like a grapefruit size. Oh, what? <laughs> Man, it smells so good. I can smell it from here. Yeah. <laughs> This is a lemon. You can see I'm not cringing. It's actually very aromatic. It's very floral. And it's, it's soft, yeah. Um, well, I will never have a lemon again <laughs> from the supermarket. I'll need to get you to ship them. Yeah, it could be like express delivery. Yeah. <laughs> Only have lemons once a year and it'll be all from you. <laughs> so much sweeter, I would rather wait and indulge in the short season than have it year round and have it taste ordinary. Yeah. <laughs> it's worth it. Sarah has been running Pope's Produce for 11 years, but she wasn't a farmer all her life. Quite the opposite, in fact. We planted 40 fruit trees in our first year, and I had no vegetable growing background, no business background. So you started from nothing, zero? Yeah, zero. Self-taught farmer? Grassy, yes, absolutely. So you sound pretty happy being a farmer. It's a lifestyle choice. Yeah. This, this particular model is a lifestyle choice. Other models that are more profitable um, can be 60 hours a week plus and I have kids, I have interests and I'm just not prepared to do that. Some people are and love it but it's just not the model for me and the joys of social media meant that I could build my customer base and they were along for the journey as much as I was so they were prepared to share the risk, pay up front for the season and then I had the working capital to be able to plant out and they knew what they were getting. Right, right. So this is very communicative. Very much, very transparent. I email them on a Monday with their newsletter so they can plan their meals. There's minimal food waste, no chemical use and it's just constantly building soil, keeping the soil happy to keep the plants happy. Happy plants, happy people. Nice. <laughs> and snails. Oh yeah. So the integrated pest management here is me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no chemicals. Pope's Produce follows three basic concepts. Fair share, earth care, and people care. So your farm is not just a farm. No, it's, it's a community hub as well. It's a community yeah. hub, essentially. And so the farming is just like a tool to attract yes. people. Yes, yeah, very much so. Wow. Yep. So how do you see your role in this? Predominantly as an education platform. So we run a lot of workshops, open garden days, so people can realise that you can do life like this and you can connect to food. Oh. You can grow certain elements at home that have beauty, flavour to them. You don't have to go to the shop for everything. It's interesting. I thought the first thing you would say is, oh, I'm, I'm a farmer and I grow food for the community. Yeah. But I always wanted a service-based business. So primarily, Pope's Produce is a service of education first, and the food is almost a byproduct, or it's an edible education. I try to vary it each week and give my customers lots of diversity. I leave some of the soil in the garden, and that's it. That's easy. Very. It's really nice. So with the rainbow chart, Chris will get a few different coloured stems. Like this one's harvest from the outside, working it. This is why it's called Rainbow Chart. Look at the colour. It's so pretty. It's just looking at this makes me so happy. I know. With these lettuces, again, the outside, grab a few leaves so we get the maximum from each lettuce's life. So they will grow back? Yep, they continue to grow rather than growing back. And there we go. Okie dokie, we'll head down for the kale now. And again, 
This one is start from the ground and work our way up. We just snap it back against the way it's growing. Um, like how tall um, does it get? The tallest I've let it get is maybe about yay high. Wow. Yeah. We had basil last summer that was tall enough for me to hide behind. <laughs> that was pretty Same. impressive. Just looking at the leaves, they, they are flawless. It's all They're gorgeous, yeah. Right. Or the wood chip on the path, we're lucky that there's a local arborist, so tree lopper. So he brings it here and then the wood chip being a carbon material will eventually break down to feed the soil. So I'm getting free waste material from one area to come and work at the farm. These chive flowers are so pretty. I think we need some of these in the CSA as well. So they've got the onion flavour, but then the flowers can be also used as garnish. Okay, so the last one, we'll grab some of these sage flowers. Because the leaves fried up in butter are one of the best things ever. And then we'll just get some more of these sage flowers to add to the mix today, a tangled one. Um, is there a lot of education needed to teach people how to use your produce? Not a lot, but some certainly around flowers. So there's the benefit of the newsletter going out as well, is that I can mention okay, these flowers are edible, this is how you use them. And people appreciate that, but my customers will also send me emails of things that they've received to say, how do I cook with, how do I use this? So it's a really nice open forum of teaching each other. Mmm, that's amazing. It's a lot of fun. Okay, let's get these in the water. Get that field heat out of them, so then we can wrap them up for the customers. Cold shower. Yeah! Cold shower is always good for you. So you know, it's coming to this place, right looks like a typical suburban house. I was expecting like maybe a lawn with some vegetables. I definitely wasn't expecting like this crazy jungle, forest, you know, community farm concept. I found all these different pieces of fabric, so inspired by the Japanese furoshiki. So everything gets wrapped up for my customers. Oh. So they're getting little gosh. parcels. That's such a good idea. Urban farming doesn't have to be that whole intensive, high-tech farming model. It could be a space for bringing community together. Look, my little baby. No, <laughs> it could be a space for jumping on that trampoline. And I really hope that we can explore more of such diverse concept, more of such unique experiences. And I think urban farming can be anything that we want it to be. So this is a great inspiration for me. So, we've got another big announcement. I'm getting married today. And since I have a captive audience, they'll have to eat whatever I serve. This is uh, the rendang crocodile that uh, Chris uh, requests. The menu is inspired by my travels around Asia and all the wonderful dishes I've experienced along the way. This is a sour fruit salad. It's a very Asian salad, celebrating all the local produce. This is a nasi ulam, chumeri rice with 12 different kinds of uh, local herbs. It's almost like a Southeast Asian version of a rice salad. And since I'm a cricket farmer... So we're making like the cricket sambal. Cricket sambal! So uh, we don't see like the cricket form. Ah. Right. Not to show all the legs and the wings. Actually, the flavour is also almost identical to the shrimp paste, right? So it's perfect, like, this dish you chose is such a familiar... Yeah. Thing. I do feel a little bit bad, <laughs> like, crushing the, the whole crickets. If you are creating a dish, like, you can see the whole cricket on top, like, then nobody will dare to try. Actually, the concept of the menu is something that I, I got inspired by after tasting of food. Or like the Malay archipelago cooking. Yeah. So this menu will have some of the usual suspects, but there'll be some of the exotics as yeah. well. Like crocodile meat. Yeah. <laughs> it's not seasoned yet. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Ooh. <gasps> Spicy. <laughs> Damn, you went crazy with the chili. <laughs> At first I was like, the wedding might not be uh, the best time to serve it. But I think after we had more chats, it became more like a fun idea, like test the market, see how real people react to it. So we just try to get the right balance of sweet, salty, umami. Okay, our cricket samba is done. Wow. It's so delicious actually. Thanks. So Chris, our last item for the day, the cricket crackers. Cool! This just looks like black sesame crackers right? or brown rice crackers. Exactly, you're so good at camouflaging. Right? <laughs> just hide all the scary face. Do you think Singaporeans are ready for this? 
Uh, I guess so. Because as long as like the food tastes good, I, I think like okay, Singaporeans don't mind trying. And also my friends have no choice. <laughs> you have to show face, they have to eat it. Hi everyone, dinner is served. Indonesian or regional, yeah. Inspired? Yes, yes. I'm uh, Indonesian. I smell it and I'm like, this is definitely Indonesian. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. It, it tastes awesome. Oh! Yeah, you can't really taste the cricket. That's the thing. I was hoping to taste some of it. You know what? Actually, the cricket makes it more flavorful. It's like MSG powder. Oh! Yeah, it's like the peanut thing. It really has all the combinations, all the flavors. Yummy, right? How does it taste? Great. Great! It's an insect. What? <laughs> Are you sure? See all this? You see this? There's a leg. There's a great leg. Ah, I think it's quite kind of like a surprise. Yeah. Because I, I imagine I was eating normal food. Yeah. Like, oh, that's very interesting. Good, good, yeah, good. Yeah, that's a good idea. Whose idea? Your idea. My idea. <laughs> great job. Of course. <laughs> Thanks. This is Chef Glenn, uh, childhood buddy of mine. <laughs> and we'll see what the expert has to say about cricket. Cricket is good. Tastes like uh, anchovies or heavy. To me, like, good use for sambal, like Chef did today. But I think there's many uses you can do it for if it's not in its whole piece. I talked about this today with my staff today, exactly. Because I told everyone, like, you did crickets. And they're like, oh no, you can't serve crickets uh, at work. But maybe if you blend it, how about that? Maybe if you put it in your sauce, nobody knows. Then you tell them after. Yeah. <laughs> so good. Yeah. So in my earlier days as an urban farmer, it was all about rooftop farming. But today, the urban farming scene is very, very different. We have a lot of micro farms. We have farms exploring novel foods like alternative proteins. We are really entering a brave new world of urban farming. And that's really exciting. I'm really here to ride this wave of this new excitement and this new innovation. And today, I'm a seaweed farmer. Then you put it here. It's uh, kind of just like raking leaves. Wow, I got a big bunch. I want people to consume the local seaweed. And I know that a country like Malaysia, we have potential to grow the seaweed due to our natural condition. So I want to maximize that potential. As a seaweed scientist, I don't want my research just abandoned or being left at the lab or become like a, just a, a publication of papers and produce how many master or PhD students. <laughs> I want our people can get affordable seaweed as a superfood and seaweed can also take care of the environment. Yeah, I've always yeah. thought of seaweed as like the trees of the sea. Yes, yes, exactly. Right? Yeah. It stores carbon, yeah. It, it, yeah. it creates ecosystem yeah. services. Yes, it does yes. so many good things. You are, you are right. So it provides habitat for the uh, marine organism. It also can reduce a strong wave from the ocean to the shore. In Japan, you, it's surrounded by the coastal area and seaweed farming has been established a long time ago. And in Southeast Asia, we only know about Japanese or Korean seaweed because that is the only available seaweed in the market. Our way forward for this seaweed has many applications. For example, introduce the seaweed as a fresh salad. This is a brave new world for you, right? It's like you're currently getting feedback, you know, figuring out the market as well. Yeah, yeah, I reached out to more than three to 400 people to consume this seaweed. So during pandemic, I myself went on the grab uh, delivery and then sent it to them. No way. Yeah, yeah. So I, I worked together with my sister-in-law to come up with the salad in a dish form. So that's how I, I started. So you, you literally like went to knock on yeah, the door? Yeah, I knocked like, on the yeah, door. I, I took an order from uh, uh, WhatsApp group or whatsoever. So 
I just sent to them. And how did that go? I told them this is a super food, this is a future food, this is, we, we grow it here. Uh, it has a lot of uh, nutritional benefit. They were open, yeah, they, they were they open, open to it, it mentally. Yeah, they're and, open to it. And you yeah. found the right opportunity yeah, to yeah, test it out yeah. there. Ooh, that's like a huge, this is like an entire seaweed uh, forest. Spot. Seaweed yeah, forest. Exactly. <laughs> nice. Coming here, I'm really quite inspired by Dr. Adidi's work. It almost feels like he's a kindred spirit in this field of farming. You know, in my journey, I've always tried to look at farming as a way to solve environmental or social challenges. So it's nice to know that there's a community of people trying to use agriculture to, to change the world. And I think this could possibly be the way forward where you're solving problems, but also trying to make farming economically viable. So we put on the drying rack, just take the seaweed that we clean. Then you just spread it evenly. What's your vision for this farm? We want to give impact to the society. We want to make this as a centre of excellence for seaweed farming. So after the drying process, we can see impurities. So this one you have to remove. You can help me Q QC my QC. QC yeah. <laughs> Pass or fail? Well, wow, you got almost 100%. Alright. And we want to introduce a sustainable model for aquaculture industry. <laughs> so, the in the future, we want to introduce integrated multi-trophic aquaculture uh, system here. We want to farm seaweed with fish. On the land, we want to farm abalone because abalone consume the seaweed as their main diet. From this system, it will ensure the sustainability or the production of each species without create a negative impact on the environment. So, what's in the nugget? Mostly uh, seaweed and we mix with uh, other herbs, so 100% from plant. Wow! What I've observed is that the farmers in the region are doing some really innovative things. They are creating really good quality products. The question is, will the consumers buy it? Will the consumers be able to accept all these new innovations? And that's a question that I think all of us still don't know. The naga is very interesting. It tastes mm -hmm. a bit like, like sweet potato or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's why I'm going to do a pop-up at a farmer's market to see whether the consumers are willing to test out some of these foods. So this morning I'm at City Sprouts, which is an urban farming incubator, and they hold farmers markets once every two months. Hello, bro. How are you? You good? Oh, yeah, good. How are everything? Is this the first market you've been? Yeah. Uh, it is. Okay. It's actually a crab and corn pie. Oh. So, so today I'm selling nori tacos. G W. Something very unique. Something I've never done before. This will be the longest ever hashtag in the history of Instagram. I'm here to test out mushrooms from John and seaweed from Dr. Adibi. So this is what, what it's going to look like. Everybody knows what taco is. So I'm, I'm using that as a sick way to introduce these ingredients. I'm basically using something that's familiar and mixing it up with something that is new. I heard that this gut brings good fortune. So by touching it, I'm hoping that we'll rake in a lot of money today. More business! <laughs> yeah, so I'm actually not going to set a price for my tacos. I'm going to let the consumers pay whatever they like. And I'm really curious to know how much they are willing to pay for it. Yeah, we have um, mushroom or seaweed tacos in a seaweed shell. There is an option to do half and half, <laughs> maybe. Yeah, you want to try that? Okay. And it's pay what you like. Oh. Yeah. So it's a social experiment of sorts. No idea what to do. <laughs> I'm hoping that they will pay a high amount actually for, for these tacos. I mean, how much they pay would translate into their perceived value of these produce. This farmer is trying to turn this into a product where people eat the whole seaweed. So these mushrooms are called Yanagi mushrooms. Really, they're grown in Japan, in yeah, the mountains. Yeah. But these are grown here in Singapore, in an industrial estate. So interesting. Yeah. There's a lot of explaining going on, which is great. Customers are being very interested. You can tell in their faces, they're like, what's going on? What, what is this interesting menu? That's exactly what I was hoping for. Kind of nervous. Oh my god, my hands are trembling. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Thank you, enjoy. Yeah, I, I think I will. Yay! Yeah, it feels good. I'm really buzzed right now. 
I'm like trembling. I couldn't, couldn't even put the taco together properly. Do I need one? Sorry? It's good. It's good. She said it's good. And she gave feedback. She said the seaweed is too stringy, so you're like getting all the strands, the long strands of seaweed, so we need to cut it up. It's all about you. It's all about you. I'm gonna do a delivery. Yeah. There it is. There you go. Oh, so sweet. Thank you so yeah. much. <laughs> we have two options. So forest is mushrooms. And then sea is a kind of seaweed from Malaysia. Yeah. So it's like a sushi roll, crispy sushi roll. So you guys uh, have a restaurant or? No, it's just a special pop-up just for today. Oh, yeah. Okay. So we found some local farmers growing these really special mushrooms. There you go. Done the payment. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there. How are you doing? Good. We're doing a nori taco today. I know my wife. Oh, cool, 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 cool. cool, cool. seconds. Oh, she's talking about seconds. Yeah, nice. Very good. Thank you. It's very delicious. Yeah. Yeah. Great. great. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. It's a bit of uh, mind blowing. Mind blowing. Yeah. The customer just said it was mind blowing. Wow. So that that really made my day. Okay. Let's go half half. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. So these are from these guys. Yeah. Yanagi Matsutake. Okay. Yanagi Matsutake. Normally it's growing in the in the mountains in the forest. Okay. Yeah, where it's much colder. Oh. Okay. I think we think urban farming is just vegetables. Right. 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 And you don't think mushrooms or premium mushrooms. Right. Right. Uh, that's good in the industrial estate. Right, right. So I'm here to like introduce all these things to them. Okay. So hopefully like change the idea of what urban farming can be. Yeah. Okay. Okay. How much? Huh? Just a magic question. It's huh? actually a pay what you like. Because we want to see how they perceive the product. And then after you pay, I'm curious to know how much you think it's worth. Oh, at which point do I pay? Why don't you, you eat it first and then you pay after you eat it? Because I'm pretty confident. <laughs> very good. It's very good. Mm. I really like the texture of this. The seaweed. The seaweed, yeah. yeah. Like the Thai sauce and flavor. It's very good. Ooh. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I love your reaction. Oh, she's so happy. Oh yeah, I like the mushroom more. Right, okay. Yeah. Uh, like, just be, just be like honest. Like. 18. 18? Yeah. For one? 18 dollars? You sure I'll just pay 18 dollars for the taco? Oh my god. Because locally produced, right? Oh my god. And most people have been paying about 8 to 10 dollars. Uh, which is about what it should cost from base, working backwards from what the ingredients cost. But I think what Michelle is saying that because of the premiumness and the freshness of the ingredients, she's willing to pay a premium for it. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Oh, so yeah, it's, it's looking really good. It's pay what you like, yeah. I have no idea. Yeah, you're discuss lah, you're discuss, you're discuss. What okay. is it? What, what's, yeah, what's inside? The main thing is this mushroom is just with a teriyaki sauce. It just harvested yesterday. And the seaweed is uh, with a Thai dressing, a spicy Thai dressing. Oh, grown here. This is from Wong, Malaysia. So, how much do y'all pay for it? We paid $10. $10? Yes. Okay, wow. Okay. Just curious, how much do y'all pay for it? $20. 20 oh! Really? It's actually nicer than Nobu. The seaweed that you do. Really? Nobu, no way. Really, really good. You are the highest bidder for today. Oh, you really? broke the record. This is really, really yummy. Yes. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so Marcus, you paid twenty dollars and one cent. Yeah. You just broke the record. I just broke the record. Oh my gosh, you're so competitive. Record. I am, I am. But just now you paid ten dollars for the yeah, so I kind of, I, I, I feel bad about it. So part of it's guilt. There's a guilt. There's a guilt <laughs> substance. There's a guilt tax to it. But it's really, really good. So actually, we are sold out of all the mushrooms, but I've decided to use the display ones uh, as a final resort. So we're gonna use it all up and. Yeah, and we are sold out. So, it's amazing. I, I'm, I'm so happy. In summary, it's been a really good day. I think there's been a lot of excitement from the customers, a lot of interest. Uh, there are a lot of questions about what ingredients were in there. 
and there was a lot of feedback as well, a lot of conversations. In total, we earned about $190, and the cost of all the tacos was probably about half of that. It shows that consumers are willing to pay more for local produce if they understand the value of it. So I think Future Foods is not just about creating the most novel food, but it's, it's really about having a good product and connecting with the customers. All right, thank you. Oh, so do, you're not actually going to sell this in time after that? No, no. No! My <laughs> wife is good! Welcome home! Welcome home! The idea of making connections is really my biggest takeaway from this season of Growing Wild. Because if we all start to connect the dots, we'll understand what it takes for food to actually reach our plates. If you can grow any food, you're taking the pressure off the farmers. That saves trees. It would be great if more circular urban farm systems can be built. In aquaculture, you have the fish and you are using the fish poop to fertilise the plants here, which is in the hydroponics. Or if we accept that agriculture with culture is so much more than without it. When they come together to work on something meaningful that enhances their ability to understand ecosystem, ecology, sustainability, food security. Then, it will truly be a brave new world. I think what's important is that the farmers continue to innovate and we, we continue to bring this innovation to the consumers and we, we need to build relationships with them. Wow, it's amazing. And it becomes a very nice journey for, for the consumers as they learn about what can be done in Singapore. Okay, that's it. We are starting a real business after today. Magic tacos or something. <laughs>